Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I'm delighted to now introduce the plenary session for the McGill uh, Conference. Um, we have two um, key, well-established and well-renowned speakers on international entrepreneurship. Professor Antonella Suchella from the University of Angela Ruskin, Angela Ruskin uh, Cambridge, and also the University of Pavia, Italy. And second, we have um, Professor Hamid Etmad, who told me to say he's done enough crimes on the internet that you should recognise him, but I probably said that in a really not way. See, it's how you say it, isn't it? I didn't say that well, so. And also to chair this session, we have Professor, equally a renowned, established um, scholar in the field of international entrepreneurship, Professor Svante Anderson, the University of Hampstead. And not only that, but we have um, really a large cohort from the University of Hansad, and I'm really grateful for you to coming, for coming. Um, we have Ulf, Gabriel, Helena, um, and um, Klaus as well. Okay, uh, Solomon from Hansad. I just also want to say uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a personal note that um, Svant has been a fantastic colleague and has been really supportive over the last number of years because I'm visiting in Hansad University for the last two years. I've been a visiting scholar be fellow before since 2012 and um, I just want to say I really appreciate the support and also the mentoring you've given me the last few years. So um, thank you very, very much for that. That's and a pleasure, you know that. <laughs> um, but also, um, Svante is also going to chair the session but also say a few words on the next McGill, the 22nd McGill Conference on International Entrepreneurship, which Hampstead will host, host next year. So I'll leave it over to you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. So, thank you for this opportunity to chair this plenary session and say a couple of words to us that you're all very welcome to Hamstam next um, year. Sorry, Svante, can you stand there? I should stand there. So, welcome to Hamstam next year. You can, it's the 22nd of August, and you can go into the website so you can read a little bit more about it, but we will also fill in more information. So I also, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have a lot of helpful colleagues and Hamid will help me and Natasha also promised to help me. And all from Hamstar, can you stand up please? So if, if you have any questions, yeah, yes, just call them whenever during the... <laughs> So I learned the best way to organize is to decentralize, so ask all the other people here. Yeah? So my, my role today is just to keep track of time. And we have this distinguished speaker here. So we'll start with yeah, Professor Antonella Sukella, University of Pavia. And she's gonna talk about international entrepreneurship a business strategy, a missing link. And then we will have yeah, Professor Hamid at MAD. Everybody knows him in that, this area. He's the only one who, he and David Crick is here. Yeah, I think you're the only one who have been at all of, of those conferences. And he will come next year to Hamstad too. I know, he, he's one of the keynote speakers, so. Welcome. And, uh, Please, Antonella. Well, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, uh, talking about uh, something that uh, um, I really would like to discuss with you. Uh, I will also try to, to provoke a bit of uh, discussion around this, uh, this issue. Hmm? Uh, let's talk about strategy and international entrepreneurship. Is there a missing link here or not? Um, and uh, first, uh, let me say what is strategy, hmm? what I mean, uh, not what is in general, but what I mean today and what I want to discuss when I speak about strategy. Um, I'm not sure it's very clear, but um, okay, if you can read it. Um, I, we can start from what strategy is not, hmm? what I don't think strategy is at the moment. Uh, it's not the big strategy, as some authors call it. The big strategy is the big plan carved in the stone that nobody remembers after a few weeks and nobody applies or uh, 
tries to. It's not a rule book. Um, a strategy is a design and method and action. A strategy is um, designing a path and executing a path. And the two things frequently intertwine, they go together. The idea is to create competitive advantage. This we know very well. Uh, we know more or less which is the, uh, the end, is the creation of a competitive advantage so that we support value creation and value capture. So this is the most recent view when we speak of uh, strategy. And here I refer to the last article of Powell 2017 on uh, providing this uh, view of, of strategy. Also grounding this view in the idea that nowadays we are facing a discontinuity in the uh, environment given by the emergence of new technology, think of the industry 4.0 scenario, discontinuity in uh, global markets and economies because uh, the apparently never-ending trend towards globalization is now threatened and might have some stops or even steps back. So what it says, in the, especially in an era of discontinuity, um, companies uh, need to, uh, and executives, speaks of executives, we might speak of entrepreneur in our case, strategize and act at the same time. Well, the intersection between strategy and entrepreneurship uh, is not new. I mean, we have since a few years a journal, Strategic Entrepreneurship. And if you look at what is happening uh, in uh, strategic management studies, they increasingly speak the language of entrepreneurship. Because when you think of dynamic capabilities, even the latest TIS is sounding very much like uh, an entrepreneurship contribution. Um, so, what are the uh, components of strategy that I want to discuss today? Hmm? Uh, goals, strategic goals, competitive strategy, and the business model. Hmm? Uh, and as I mentioned before, the uh, idea is that they must be addressed to create competitive advantage, create and capture value in the end. Hmm? Uh, let's come to international uh, firms. Hmm? Uh, which is the role of strategy uh, and the role for strategy in, uh, in international firms? Uh, well, what I'm going to say and discuss with you today is Strategy is one of the pieces of the puzzle. To me, a very important piece. The puzzle is all what we have written about what matters for international growth. And people here have written a lot on determinants, drivers of international growth. I think that strategy is a very important piece of this puzzle that we need probably to highlight um, more uh, why more? Because in the end, strategy is the ex expression, the visible expression uh, in terms of firm uh, behavior and not only firm design, the visible expression of entrepreneurial discretion. Hmm? Um, and because it provides a very important guidance in this discontinuity uh, that I mentioned before, so I quote Amid, is a, a speech is going to be about uh, uh, sailing into troubled waters, if I remember correctly. So strategy is a guidance for sailing into troubled waters. Mm -hmm. uh, what is strategy in international firms? Uh, we, we can still use very well my pen definition uh, about strategy, um, how to compete successfully in uh, different markets. Um, this is not a new issue. Hmm? Um, I would like to remind um, uh, that uh, already uh, Raid, 1983, uh, wrote a, a great article, and in that article um, it was established a link, uh, sorry, it was established that strategy is the link between what the author called 
managerial philosophy, and we can easily call it entrepreneurial orientation, mindset, uh, and so on, resources, opportunities. Hmm? Um, but I think this link was not really completely explored in the following uh, years. So the question is, is there a gap in studies? I think there is, but um, my opinion does not count. So I will refer to the opinion of other uh, more important uh, authors that repeatedly in, uh, in the last decades uh, have insisted on uh, a gap in studies here. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's think of uh, the famous article Mel in 92 on Jeeps uh, where he said uh, about multinational companies, where is the strategy? Um, Ricard, 2004, again on Jeeps, they reviewed all the articles on Jeeps from 1970 till uh, 2004 and only 11 articles were explicitly dealing with general strategy according to the, the Finnish magazine. Uh, let's come closer to our field, uh, 2004 again, Bell Creek and, uh, and Young uh, on international SME strategy, insisting there was a gap here. Hmm? Uh, Zara and George, 2002, uh, we need to understand better how entrepreneurial firm uh, design and execute their uh, business strategy. And coming to, uh, more recently, Love and Roper on uh, exporting SMEs and, again, claiming uh, there is a gap here. Uh, so, uh, of all these uh, calls, let's say, I could quote more, but I don't want to annoy you too much. Uh, I have chosen uh, one, uh, Bell and uh, Crick and Young, 2004, uh, and this quote still valid nowadays, in my opinion. Hmm? What are the critical strategic choices made by small firms in their early growth years, and to what extent are these strategic decisions uh, interrelated? This is also a way to remember how still actual is uh, our um, literature and uh, a tribute to Jim, a uh, great friend. Uh, why is this gap relevant? Hmm? Well, I think I mentioned this before, why it is in my opinion. Because it highlights managerial or entrepreneurial, better in our language, entrepreneurial discretion. Hmm? Uh, as you know, uh, for example, the process models of internationalization have been attacked from the point of view of determinism. Hmm? Um, and in 1990, in responding to the uh, criticism about determinism in the Uppsala model, Johnson and Wallner write this sentence. Huh? The internationalization process, once started, will tend to proceed regardless strategic decisions. Uh, but, Determinism is an enemy which is always around. Hmm? Um, an enemy because if we work on entrepreneurship, determinism to me is an enemy. Hmm? Because entrepreneurship is about volition, <coughs> it's about discretion, it's about innovation, it's about proactivity. Um, well, determinism might be around even in international entrepreneurship because as yesterday guest speaker mentioned, when you cross uh, disciplines, when you work at the intersection, sometimes you drag some assumptions from uh, one of these fields. Um, this is the critique that, again, has not been made by myself, uh, but uh, the last article of Echo Outio on strategic entrepreneurship. Uh, addresses this issue hmm? uh, and uh, uh, comments how a deterministic stance can be found in research, in international entrepreneurship too, 
which explains internationalization as the outcome of existing networks or previous experience. Hmm? Uh, I am not saying these things do not matter. Hmm? I don't want to generate uh, too much discomfort. I think they do not matter that much, but this is my personal opinion. Uh, I'm not saying they do not matter. I'm saying let's look also at other pieces of the puzzle, as I was mentioning from the start. Um, so let's try to frame this, the topic of strategy in international entrepreneurship. We know our foundations. Uh, we are talking, I mentioned before, of innovativeness, proactivity, uh, risk-taking, not risk uh, escaping. Yeah? Um, so how do they shape strategic goals, competitive strategy or business strategy, and uh, business models? Uh, we have only partial answers, I think, to this question, so probably we need more. I, this is a slide I already um, showed before, but just to recap uh, what we mean by strategy in this specific um, circumstance and discussion. Uh, first, strategic goals. Why firms go abroad? Um, here we have uh, an Italian company, ice cream, Grom, you might know Grom. Uh, it has been acquired by Unilever last year, so it's no longer uh, an independent uh, firm, a born global, truly born global, um, founded by two young entrepreneurs, no previous experience, not even in the ice cream. The entrepreneurs were used to say, Oh God, we had a lot of experience. We have been eating ice creams for 20 years. Uh, this is the experience they had. No, no pre-existing network, nothing. They start up a, uh, up a business. They could stay happily in Italy and make enough profit in uh, staying domestic. They wanted to go to the United States. Hmm? When they were asked why, they said, oh, this is our strategy. It's our strategic goal. Uh, on the other side, I put uh, some references from literature. Uh, Benito 2015 basically is saying the same thing. Let's look at goals. Hmm? Um, how firms compete? Hmm? So from goals, we move to business uh, strategy. Uh, well. We know that it matters. I'm quoting Knight and Cavus Gil, but many uh, of the people here have written articles where they refer somehow to one way or another born global firms or cases of international entrepreneurship compete. Hmm? Um, but we need to understand better um, this point. Here I make two examples. One is um, a company based in Strasbourg. They do um, advanced equipment for the hydromechanic um, applications. Uh, and they say, well, our approach to grow global our business strategy for global market is um, quality, high quality, high specialization, high differentiation, targeting uh, global customers. Uh, and then we have Ryanair, uh, a tribute to Ireland in this case. Uh, Ryanair CEO in an interview of November 2016 declares, our strategy is cost focus, no doubt. We, we were already rather clear about it. But yes, the challenge for us in the future is to keep uh, driving airfares down. Hmm? The strategic plan of Ryanair for the next year is possibly sell tickets at zero euro possibly, um, which is, wow, this is a real cost leadership strategy, huh? meaning that they plan to make money in another way, to create value and capture value in other ways. So these are two very different competitive strategies. Hmm? Uh, 
Uh, if we use the old Porter terminology, one is differentiation and the other is cost leadership, but now I think we can use also more recent uh, frames. Hmm? Um, so we come through the Ryanair example to the third and last bit of the strategy, the business model. Hmm? Because the business model, once you have chosen a competitive strategy, tells you how you want to generate revenue and which type of costs you have. So you can pursue, like Ryanair, a cost leadership strategy in one way or with a different business model. Um, so regarding the role of the business model, we don't have so much literature, though I'm very happy to see in this conference a number of contributions and even of uh, PhD um, proposals touching on this uh, issue. Um, we have something on business model replication to explain early and fast internationalization and uh, business model scalability. Because the point with business model is not only that we need to understand which are the components, the pieces of the business model in international entrepreneurship. But we also need to know how business model, some business models, enable early and fast international growth. And to enable early and fast international growth, business models might be transferable, replicable, scalable. Hmm? One of these or the three together. Um, here we have an example um, taken from The Economist, November 2015. They are commenting on BlaBlaCar. I think you are all familiar now with BlaBlaCar, this car-sharing uh, uh, company uh, founded in France. This is a born global firm, certainly. And uh, The Economist is commenting on BlaBlaCar early and fast international growth, explaining it in terms of their business model, which is similar to Airbnb business model. In fact, if we go to Airbnb, we have this article from Stanfle on um, scalability of business model. And it says, well, uh, the factors, among the factors that led ARB to uh, enormous global growth, <coughs> the key factor is scalability of the business model. Uh, so these are the, the two companies. So, uh, from these examples and matching examples with, with literature we might, which might support them, um, I think I, I try to argue uh, what I call the missing link. Hmm? Not that it's totally missing, but I think we need more, more research around this. Uh, we have entrepreneurial orientation, we have entrepreneurial opportunities, um, at the end, we have value creation and value capture. What's in the middle? Hmm? I think that, among other pieces, one of the things in the middle or the things in the black box uh, are strategic goals, business uh, strategy and uh, business model. Um, so, what is strategy in the end? Strategy in the end is a bridge in my view. Hmm? It's a bridge that connects the present to the future, the goals with the execution. Do you remember the entrepreneurship uh, workshop, industrial workshop we had um, on um, uh, Wednesday? Thank you. That was very interesting. I think this is a very good thing that uh, this conference has. We listen to entrepreneurs. Hmm? And they always inspire us in many ways. I have heard the word strategy at least 30 times. Then I stopped counting. Hmm? Um, I heard the word execution at least 10 times as a critical thing. Huh? So we need to link design with execution. Strategy is a good way to do it, especially if we mean strategy as practice. Huh? Um, we connect orientation vision with value creation and value capture. Strategy connects exploration and exploitation. 
connects more generally the known with the unknown, with special reference to distance. Hmm? Distance is the unknown. Hmm? And uh, um, when I speak of distance, I'm not speaking only of geographic distance, cultural distance. Think of technological distance. If I am a manufacturing firm in this day, and uh, as it's happening in many Italian firms, I'm producing uh, machinery. Hmm? And they tell me, oh, now there is Industry 4.0 coming, so your model of manufacturing will be completely disrupted in a few years. You have to embrace uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, 3D printing. Uh, well, this is also <laughs> connecting the known and the unknown. This is distance from the technological frontier. So you need a strategy to, to connect uh, these uh, distances, let's say. Hmm? Um, so this is a graphic representation of what I said, a strategy linking in the firm uh, exploration, exploitation, orientation, with value creation, and so on, and linking also all these types of distance. Uh, because uh, in entrepreneurship, distance has a different meaning. Uh, in international business, distance is a liability, liability of foreigners. Um, entrepreneurship does not deny this, but simply embraces the possibility that distance is a promise, is a promise of more value creation. So it's a source of opportunities also. Um, and I conclude with this uh, example. I don't know if you came across uh, Diana Nayad. Um, at age 64, uh, she was the first person, not the first woman, huh? the first person, man or woman, swimming from Cuba to Florida without a shark cage. Hmm? This is a fantastic case. Um, sometimes I use her speech as uh, a TED talk for my student also, motivational speech. Um, and uh, she says, for the fifth time, I have been in front of uh, that shore. Hmm? looking at the distant horizon, believing again I'm gonna make it. Hmm? All that way across the vast, dangerous uh, wilderness of an ocean. The talk is not about madness. The talk is about strategy. Because then she explains, I did this, but I needed to build a team. A team with the necessary uh, capabilities. I needed resources. I needed to find sponsors. I need to train myself very hard. She tried five times before doing it. Uh, and then she speaks of strategy as practice. She had a strategy to manage this long distance swim, but on the way she encountered a storm, uh, hopefully not sharks, uh, and so on. So she had to adjust the strategy continually to the goal. But the talk is about strategy. Hmm? And it's about uh, capturing opportunities to create uh, value. Thank you. Any questions, comments?
Uh, I hope people here will help me in finding it. A major problem here is that uh, I'm a bit skeptical about experience and existing networks. Hmm? The empirical evidence, as you know, is uh, conflicting. Hmm? Uh, so we cannot say there is a clear empirical evidence that they matter. And in some studies it does, in some it doesn't. So this means that there is something playing there. Uh, they might be a part of the story, uh, but under which conditions? Uh, if I have to move from, let me make an example, traditional manufacturing to industry 4.0, experience and existing networks probably uh, will represent um, a liability. Hmm? Um, so um, I think they might matter, but under conditions. This is my personal opinion, but honestly, I'm not ready to provide an answer, and I would be really happy to discuss uh, more about this. Or I mentioned the case of Grom, these two young uh, founders. They chose for the United States. They chose a business. They had no experience. They chose for the United States. They didn't know anybody there. But I also think of, again, our industrial workshop. I um, was impressed by um, Deirdre uh, Took, the uh, seaweed cosmetic company. Hmm? At some stage, one of us asked, the, but why did you go to the United States? And she said something like, that was my strategy. But she didn't have a pre-existing experience or network there. She built a network to go there. So I'm not saying they do not matter but the network was shaped to go there. Otherwise, <laughs> if you keep on running on the same tracks, um, then, uh, well, that's probably the terminism, and uh, normally I don't like it, but that's my personal. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, uh, probably in our understanding of how strategy plays in these uh, in these companies. So I I agree with you uh, absolutely, and uh, uh, I come from strategy as well. So <laughs> uh, um, maybe that's why I have this. Uh, we are all biased somehow. So <laughs> I have this point of view. One last question. I have a question. Um, Entrepreneurship is practiced from the bell there in terms of one could argue, and you mentioned that mm -hmm. Diana, Diaz had said it was all about practice, uh, practice, strategic mm -hmm. practice. But one also, there's an area of literature that's growing now um, of practice entrepreneurship, um, which is a field in itself, and it's becoming more realistic for more perspective to look at how these firms grow and mm -hmm. develop more routine practice here uh, yes. in terms of the example Anna that you gave with Diana mm -hmm. and I had she had to adapt. I'm more yeah. familiar with that, but in terms of entrepreneurship as a practice, which is strategy as a practice, mm -hmm. don't know your, it's not deterministic. No, but no. Well, uh, yeah, it will, this is another very important question that, uh, um, of course, we might try to, to link this, um, this field. This is 
what probably should be done also to um, understand better how things are, are going. I think uh, this, <coughs> these links can, uh, these fields can speak very well to each other and um, especially in the actual contingent world, as I said, characterized by discontinuity. Uh, referring to practice somehow is a um, very, uh, very important point of view, but I would never neglect the design uh, that gives the horizon on which you are uh, practicing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, actually, uh, my initial plan for uh, this uh, address had six parts. I'm not going to go through all the six parts. That's number one. And number two, uh, after I learned that uh, a good colleague and friend, Antonella, is here, and she's speaking about a strategy, I totally revamped everything. So number one, I'm starting with part four. And after having heard uh, uh, Antonella, I'm going to skip to the slide number eight of that part four. So I beg for your indulgence, but I get you involved in a second. We all have to learn how to uh, work with. Uh... All right. I like us to all think about something that you like to have now on demand. It could be a taxi ride. You may want to have your next apartment or next hotel. You may want to have your, your next shirt. You may have a party tonight and have a chef coming and doing everything, including the buying, the meat, the cabbages, everything. You may need to repair your basement tonight and need power tools. And the stores close here at five or six. Where do you get them? This is an emerging industry called on demand. You just demand them as you go. And most of the time you use your, your smartphone and there is an application on your smartphone. You tap on that one and the company comes on board and you say, I need a chef tonight. I need a taxi five minutes from now. I'd like to suggest, and, and at the end I say, actually, you can wish on anything on demand. And it's highly likely that your wish would be responded to right away, and it is as close or is as distant as your small self. And I'd like to suggest that is the future of international entrepreneurship. And it has just started. We have seen some of the samples of those. Airbnb is, was spoken about. Let's just stay with Airbnb for a second or two before I get, get to the next slide. Airbnb violated Johansson and Walney right and left deeply. Airbnb violated Dunning's eclectic theory, again, very, very deeply. But he's, they are using actually all the principles which are there, except for one. You remember that, uh, that Dunning's eclectic had three principles or three pillars. One was the company advantage, or he called it firm-specific advantage, local-specific advantage, and then he suggested that everything has to be internalized. Think of Airbnb. Nothing is internalized. I'll come back to that one and modify it. But actually, everything is externalized. 
Who is providing the service of Airbnb? Not Airbnb. The homeowners, the apartment owners, the dwelling owners. Where are they? They are in, in 600, 700 cities of the world. And Airbnb owns no one, none of them, and does not control any of them. You see that violations have started. We have not really acknowledged them. But at the very root of that has been entrepreneurial strategy. So the person who is behind Airbnb said, everyone, including himself, everyone has an extra bedroom. And that can be rented. That can be utilized by someone else. That is a value sitting there which is not captured. And Airbnb actually strategized to allow you to capture that value. I'd like to suggest, uh, actually this is not my suggestion, this is uh, the terminology used now in the industry. These are platform companies. They create a technological platform is highly, highly diverse, highly, highly capable, lots of capabilities, lots of abs absorbed capacity. I'll come back to, to all of them. And, and they are constantly re-scaled. They start with a small scale, but it, as they go along, the scale increases. With next apartment that joins Airbnb, with the next taxi cab or driver that joins Uber, and the next provider of uh, power tools that, that uh, joins the platform of power tools, or the next professional that joins the website or the platform of, uh, of power tool providers, expand and scale that platform. So platforms are actually, just to summarize, platforms are centralized at the headquarters. The platform, the computer, the brains are sitting at the headquarters. But aside from that, everything else is outside. So this is distributed suppliers. Actually, Professor Anderson yesterday said, context matters. Context matters. But Airbnb does not have to worry about it. Because the context is the, in the context the environment where the Airbnb apartment provider is sitting. So context matters to me if I'm going to, to operate in Indonesia. But if an Indonesian is renting an apartment or Indonesian is providing you a, support, a power tool locally, that context is not that important. So this is, this is the idea of externalization. And I think that is where we are going. So it's not the question of Airbnb, it's not the question of $60 billion uh, Uber in less than five years' time, reaching that, that level of market uh, valuation. It is actually a trend that even a small companies have started to do that. I'm living in the neighborhood of Montreal, and one day after dinner, somebody knocked on the door and said, your neighbors say you have a whole bunch of tools in your basement. That is true. In my previous life, I, I was an engineer. I'm still infatuated with mechanical tools. So I bought one set of tools because they were on sale or I just needed them very badly that day. I learned that as a professional. Those are not good tools. Then I bought the next set of tools, which were more better and more capable. Then eventually I learned that, that if you have bad tools or if you like, if I may use your terminology, bad strategy, you have to re-strategize or buy good precision tools that, that actually enable you to do the job well. Otherwise, with lousy tool, you do the job and you say, oh my God, look at that. It's not that good. And you have to redo the job. So one of my neighbors actually went to this community uh, gathering and said, oh, by the way, my neighbor has three sets of tools. He may be hanging on to his last, but the first two sets of tools are, are open. Go and ask him to, uh, to provide the tools. And um, this chap came and said, yeah, that's what your neighbor says. And um, they see you working Saturdays and Sundays with your tools. 
can we have access to, to those tools? I said, yeah, I think so. And I said, uh, by the way, we are not offering very much of money, but we offer you contacts with the rest of the neighborhood. And he started asking me, actually, how many people do I know in the entire uh, city, a small city that I live? I said, I know six or seven. He said, we give you the opportunity to know all the 4,000 people who are living here. So here is a social network. There is no money. This is actually where we are going. And that's an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. This is one man person who created the website and he connects everyone to everyone else. Just, just think about that one. If you have that, that platform, is there any boundary stopping him from going to the next city or the next province or even the next country? I, I would suggest to you that doesn't. Of course, he can adjust for the language, and we have learned this, these things, that yes, it's adjusted for language, it's adjusted for color preferences, it's adjusted for culture, it's adjusted for regulations. Uh, Professor Anderson yesterday talked about them. I'm not going to, to bore you with those. Again, I'm going to skip a whole bunch, but um, Cafe Press is a printing company that prints everything on anything that can be printed. On every single day, there are 40,000 products created. Walmart is the largest retailing company in the world, and their annual stock, SKUs, the stock keeping units, annual is 54,000. Every day, 40,000 products are created. Not all of them sit on, on, uh, on the shelves. The ones that are suggested and bought and paid for are produced. So Airbnb, we, we talked about it a lot. Um, two things that I'd like to, to add to Airbnb uh, situation. On this, we have talked about them. Antonella touched on that one, and I want to build on that. If you think of a case of Airbnb, think of yourself actually going on Airbnb platform, website, and renting an apartment, say, or, or a room, or a boat, or a houseboat, or a whole flat of a floor, or even a church. At the end of that, they ask you to evaluate the service that you received. So that information goes and sits on, on the platform of Airbnb. The next customer that uses that, that dwelling also provides the feedback. Those two pieces are integrated. The next one is also integrated. Very soon, there is a portfolio which really gives you the profile of the services of that dwelling. On the other side of this business, they ask the dwelling provider to rate the first customer. The customer comes, comes back and instead of going to Montreal, it goes to uh, Amsterdam. They ask the Amsterdam provider to say, how did this, this customer behave? And he goes to Singapore, and then they ask the Singapore provider to also say how this customer uh, behaved. So you can see the profile of the customer is also built. I suggest that this, this is where uh, we have not addressed. And actually, we are, we are stuck with, uh, with some of the terminologies of the literature. Let me start with Johansson and Walling. Johansson and Wally, uh, they, they really did a contribution to the field by saying implicit knowledge is, is important, and they call it experiential knowledge. And experiential knowledge is contextual. Professor Anderson spoke about it. It's embedded in the environment. The only way that you can get it is to live in that environment, to be able to touch that environment. 
Distance does not allow you to do that. So, you can now see that Airbnbs of the world and Ubers of the world have built a strategic bridge to that. They are not going to be there, but over time, they build the profile. They build the tacit knowledge about every single individual. That's exactly what Johansson and Walney wanted uh, their subsidiaries to do in, in outside of Scandinavia, to actually understand their market one by one. So you can see Airbnb is sitting in San Francisco and doing that. Same thing with Uber, same thing with the uh, rest, of, rest of the platform. I said that uh, I, I'd like to, to touch on some and, and in a sense use the bridge that Antonella used. So here, here is actually the bridge to learning. As this feedback comes in, they really learn about all the dwellings and they learn about all the individuals that they deal with. They have to understand those. That is where their absorptive capacity comes. So we use that one lightly, but in combination with the capabilities that they constantly put on the platform, they actually absorb all that knowledge. They build the profiles for everyone as if it was explicit knowledge and codified knowledge already. So what I'm really suggesting is, is that they, collective, they, they collect over time the tacit knowledge, the embedded knowledge, the contextual knowledge, and the codified. So the knowledge literature says you cannot really uh, codify the tacit knowledge because it is in the brains of people, it is embedded in people. But you can see that the platform companies over time extract as much information as critical to them, and they build that. I'd like to, to switch to something like uh, transportation. And I'd like to, to use the terminology that I uh, uh, already used. If you wish to be in, in uh, anywhere practically in the, in the world, you can call for a taxi by just a snapping on your uh, uh, the smartphone. I know some people are allergic to, to Uber. So I will avoid Uber. But if you happen to be in Dubai and you're still allergic to Uber, there is a company, local company, just a startup, two years old. It's called Karim. How many people have been to? Well, most most of you were in Dubai uh, for a gig, but perhaps you did not use Karim. Karim is actually starting in Bangladesh, Pakistan. I'll come. Coming to that one. So Karim, within the span of two years' time, is in Lahore, Pakistan. And, and actually, here is the Karim. We can, we can touch on that one. There's a hyperlink, and we, we go there. But uh, in favor of time, I'm not going to go there. I'd really like us to, to have a discussion at the end. But uh, if you wish, we can go there. So Karim in Lahore. So this is two-year startup, and they are competing locally with Uber. If you happen to be in Montreal, there is a company that competes with practically everyone called Tio. Tio is actually, again, relating to what Antonella said. Tio uh, started with an entrepreneur who had invested in six or seven other companies. He had $100 million in the, his back pocket, and he decided to compete with Uber. And this is his strategy. I have met with him. He's a fantastic guy. And he said, it is difficult to fight with a big black grizzly bear if he has his teeth on anywhere on your body, you are gone. So I'm not going to let the big bear, U.S. bear, to touch me. He said, Alexander, ah. He said, number one, our taxis are all electric, 100% electric. So that part of the strategy appeals to everyone who is environmentally friendly. 
His taxis are absolutely clear, absolutely nice, absolutely clean. They smell well. They are not as smelly. And every two hours, there are stations that they have to stop and vacuum practically everything. Taxi drivers are his employees, only work 88 hours a day. They are paid, they don't have to rush. They don't have to worry about money. Everything is paid to Tio through your cell phone. They are not worried about how much time it takes. They provide you total convenience. On the top of all of these things, they provide you with a laptop. The laptop is there. It's part of the taxi. You sit in the back and the laptop is there. If you have your own laptop or, or, uh, or a smartphone, they give you Wi-Fi. Mobile Wi-Fi, right there. And it's already re you, it, you are already recognized. Just you tap on your cell phone and say, I need Tio to pick me up from here. And by the time you open the door, the taxi cab presses a button and your Wi-Fi is already connected. It took me a little while, a uh, couple of nights, a uh, couple of nights back in Marriott to get online. So with Tio, I'm online and just get into. And some people actually need to have Wi-Fi as they are going from here to there. They call Tio and they are online. They don't lose connectivity. So a part of a small pieces of a strategy that this entrepreneur Alexander Taiber put into creating Tio. What are the cars that they are producing? Any guesses? Teslas, $100,000 a piece. 3000 already. And they are expanding. And if you are an international traveler coming to Trudeau International Airport in Montreal, you can pay $35 to a regular dirty taxi, but you can call Tio and book a round trip for $50. And you actually enter your schedule and the driver or the Tio driver car, a Tesla, shows up at your door, picks you up. All right. So what if you happen to be in, in Tehran, in Iran? That's a small company that just started, and it's called SNAP, S-N-A-P-P. -P. But the SNAP stands really for the SNAP in your cell phone. How does the SNAP compete? Number one, the drivers are women. Think of everything negative that we, we hear about Iran, that, that people uh, especially women, are restricted and they cannot do this and they cannot do that. Drivers are women. So that is indication to all women actually, passengers, especially girls, especially singles, that they are absolutely safe with this snap taxi. And the charges are much, much below. I'm not going to bother you with, uh, with the rest of the description, but they have taken a page out of out of Tio, they provide clean taxis, they clean everything up, and you really feel at home. It is a nice environment. And the fees are not as much. Again, let's relate to what uh, Antonella said. Think of the value, the convenience, the safety factor, the charges being low, the service being more, more uh, uh, advantageous. So, your value equation from day one, from the moment one, regardless of the price, is higher than the regular tax. That is competitive advantage. And if you have that competitive advantage, you can become globally competitively advantageous. As I said, uh, all of those hyperlinks are there, are active. I ch even checked them last, last night. They work. So a Snap now is, is moving to Shiraz which is uh, um, a touristic destination. It is moving to Isfahan. It's a 2,000-year-old city. It's another uh, uh, touristic uh, 
destination. And I don't think this is a two-year-old company, less than two-year-old company. And they did not have any venture capital. They practically capitalized themselves out of their own expansion. I started with this. You may wish upon a star. I mean, just think of something that you really like to have. And most probably Google will tell you that there is a company that does that. And perhaps tonight that can be delivered to you. And that company is not going to be based in Galway. That company is likely to be based in Copenhagen, in San Francisco, somewhere else. But they reach you. Let me build on that one. A part of uh, what Professor Zucchella said is value. That value equation has changed, and it is changing, and it's forcing everyone to change. Value based on Michael Porter was benefits versus uh, cost. And benefit was defined by the company. They said, this gadget that we are selling you has, has this dimensions, we give you five years of guarantee, we give you this service, it does this, it jumps, it walks, it talks, but they define it. So in marketing, we call them product attributes. So product attributes were designed by the research and development team, by the marketing team, and they provided the market. I have asked this question many, many, many times from students and from colleagues. Do you know all the attributes of the products? They can count the first five. So how many of those five do you use? Perhaps one, perhaps two, and it moves across people. So let's reverse that. Let's go to Veva and say, Veva, what do you really like? And Veva says, I like this attribute. Let's deliver that. I can go to Natasha and say, Natasha, what would you like? Here is this platform. We give you this range of everything. Here you have a choice. Of course, we cannot confuse that because they cannot find their, their right attribute. But if we really give them all the keys to quickly get, get to the attributes they want, they identify, they just click on those, and that's what we need to deliver. What I'm really suggesting is the following, that the ultimate customer is telling companies as to what is important to them, what products that they would like to have, and that is what they want to have and nothing else. Actually, millennials are making that one absolutely clear. I said, this is exactly what I want. I don't want extra packaging. I don't want extra this. I don't want extra that. And I'm not willing to pay for it. Period. So what is actually happening with platform companies and unicorns, and I define that one in a second or two, is that they ask the ultimate customer to define the value. Let's pause and think of that. Instead of doing a lot of marketing research, instead of doing a lot of research and development, instead of lots of community works to decide what to introduce to the market, they come to us and say, what do you want? And they deliver. So value now is the perceived value, or the value equation is becoming the ultimate customer's perceived value. And your perception of value of a product is different from my perception of that, that value. So everything is now individualized by, as a result of this strategic shift, R&D is challenged. Manufacturing is challenged. Lots of times of committees to decide to do this and that. It's thrown into garbage can because they just come and ask you, what do you want? And they provide, the, they have the rich capability and they have the absorbent, absorptive capacity to actually deliver that. Let's now pause. We are, we are sort of getting to, I'm getting to, to where I'm actually going. 
Let's pause. Do any of our theories respond, explain, and justify the behavior which has happened? Can we stop that? When Theo actually comes to uh, Galway, or the Galway counterpart of Theo starts to operate, is there anything government can do about it? Not really. You know, taxi drivers, 30,000 taxi drivers for a week, they have demonstrations in the city of Montreal, in the seat of the government in Quebec City, they stopped the traffic, they went on the bridges and turned off the, the engines and walked away. Everything was blocked, traffic is stopped, and government really had to do something about it. But people actually wanted to have deal. People even wanted to have Uber. People did not want to have the dirty taxis off, off the bus. Government actually yielded. Government had no choice. And this is precisely what is happening. So they leave no defense for the government or for the past. I'm going to switch to something else and, and add to the troubles that I see. And um, that, that one, before I get to this one, that is um, the disruptive nature of the emerging company. Most of them disrupt from below and disrupt from above. Those are Christian terminologies. When they disrupt from the below, at the very beginning, their price is lower. Their, their value delivery for that price is still superior, but their price is lower. Therefore, the incumbent say, ah, oh, uh, price is lower. We don't have to worry about it. But their scale is increases, the value increases, they appeal to you, they, as I said, they build your profile, and they really deliver your perceived value. By the time that the incumbent actually recognizes what has happened, it is too late. When they approach from the above, practically everybody can, uh, ignores them. When their prices are higher, their services are higher, they say, oh, they, they are actually um, appealing to the people who want to have luxury. But again, as the scale increases, as the time goes, and as the profiles are built, they can really come down with lower prices, better value, and they can compete from the above, which were totally ignored, with the incumbent. And incumbents find themselves, with apologies to you, totally naked. They have no choice. So they are highly, highly disruptive. Let's think of that one. Most of our small and medium-sized companies are not grizzly bears. And if you disrupt their comparative strategy, they may not survive. And to me, that is the troubled water that we are sailing towards. And unfortunately, at least I do not know of very many theories that can help me explain them or strategize. Um, if, if actually, I, as I said, I talked to uh, Alexander Taiper of Theo, and uh, I cannot see more beyond a year or two. I definitely cannot see beyond what he can see. Now, I'm going to switch to something else. Uh, in favor of time, I'll stop after this one. It's uh, a story of a, a company, two years old, less than two years old company. This is a company of four engineers. They could not even spell entrepreneurship. Two of them are one of them is mechanical engineer, one of them is a computer engineer, architect. Two of them are uh, IS engineers, or coders, or programmers. 
One thing that binds them together and makes them a team, they are avid bicyclists. They love bicycling. They are even competitively ride bicycles. And in a city like Montreal, and jokingly, there are lots of Roman drivers, and their speed is important, time is important, bicycle does not matter. You are not supposed to be even on the roads. Who are you to, to occupy the road? There are lots of accidents, and unfortunately, we have 10 or 15 deaths every year. So they came up actually with, with uh, a smartphone for their bicycle, but adjusted for the bicycle. You can tick tac your, your uh, way from point A, and you don't have to say, this is where I am. It recognizes this is where you are. And you say, that's the address of where I go. So this is the GPS feature of that. It shows you on, on that platform. You can actually click on this, this one and, and see that, that website. How do you click on that? Ah. It is on. So it is a panel like, like this on your handlebar. On each turn, it actually tells you to turn right, to turn left. It tells you all the signals there. Okay, that's all. We don't have to come. On the top of all of these things, it has, it has a, a back side and a fourth side. So if there is a truck, as you turn to the right and the truck is coming, it forwards you. And with the color coatings, if, if it is yellow, you have to be cautious. If it is green, you don't have to worry. The road is clear. If it is red, you really have to stop. So, and, and in, in uh, Montreal and, and Canada as a whole, uh, if you are driving or if you are riding a bicycle, if they catch you with your uh, cell phone texting, there's a $550 fine. And after three of those, your license will be suspended for six months. So one of the features of Halo, this is the name of the company, is that it replaces your cell phone. Everything will be right in front of you. You can receive all of your emails. You can acknowledge that you have received them. And on top of all of these things, it keeps track of where the bicycle is. So this is the anti-theft device of this bicycle because it constantly talks to GPS uh, satellites and says, this is where I am. So thieves are not going to go after those bicycles because the bicycle says, this is where I am, and police shows up in two minutes. So this is what I started saying. Four engineers had no clue what entrepreneurship was. They perceived the need, and they built it. They went to two or three uh, VCs and said, this is what we want to do. We are going to have trip, trips tick for us. And everyone said, oh, you know how to get there. You don't really need to have a GPS to get there. And said, OK. So they went to Kickstarter, crowdfunding. Kickstarter actually raised all the money they wanted. Of course, they taxed them. They, they take the 20% off. But that is not the important point that I want to make. The people, they, they wrote actually half a page of description of what Halo was going to be. And that was the promise that they provided. And Kickstarter actually put that one on the website, and people bought that promise. Of course, if you have received $250 for that one page, you're morally obligated. I say, entrepreneurially obligated to deliver. And they are still delivering after two years. This is a two-year-old company. Demand came from mostly Scandinavia, but China, India, South Africa. And here is a company that does not have anything in the way of a strategy, in the way of logistics, in the way of office. And they have received the money, and they were obligated to deliver. We do not even have a terminology for it. They were conceived globally. They were not even conceived globally. 
the design actually took them global. And if you like, they even lost track on track of globalization process. The Kickstarter actually globalized them. And they are still delivering. Of course, they are manufacturing elsewhere. The final testing is only done in Montreal. There is a Swedish logistic company that picks it up in New York and they deliver to China, to, to Sweden, to Benelux countries, Russia, India, everywhere. That is where we are going. Can we explain that? Do we have a theory that can explain it? That is actually the troubled worry that I see. So, I should perhaps uh, stop here and go back to of the 48 slides, I think I, I used three. <laughs> I'd like to, to ask us uh, to, uh, to ask ourselves, do we have theories that explain Uber's, Airbnb's halos? And if we don't, that I think you all say, yes, we cannot. I think it's incumbent upon us to begin to build this theories. I ask ourselves, are we prepared to allow anyone to define value? If we don't, Uber is going to help. Actually, I have, uh, I have a slide, couple of slides that uh, I cannot uh, internationalize Airbnb. It's difficult to say Airbnb internationalization, but it's easy to say Uberization. And I think Uberization is replacing internationalization. And uh, I find myself academically naked when it comes to Uberization. I have no defense for that. Tio does, but that's local. Do we have theories that, that, that explain the, the various phenomena? Again, if you do, you're lucky. If we don't, collectively, then it's incumbent upon us to think in those directions. Do we have actually measurements that, that truly measures the various concepts that we talk about. I'm not sure, and we don't have really very much of time, and this is the last comment I made. We constantly say SMEs that internationalize are poor. I like to challenge that idea. I like to say that our measurements are incapable of actually capturing, capturing what matters. Think of Halo, four absolutely penniless engineers. Is Halo poor? I'd say no, they're not poor. They have 16 years of education, at least each of them. They have the drive. They have spent two years designing this company. They have lots of entrepreneurial capital, lots of intellectual capital, lots of sweat capital, lots of labor. Is that a definition of a company being poor, being constrained? No, they don't have cash. They didn't have cash. They still don't have cash. But the way that we have started to think and count what matters is, is putting us in a very difficult situation. So disruptive I touched and, and I stopped. I thank you very, very much. I would have really liked to to uh, leave us a bit of time for questions. We have another maybe five minutes with the chairs. So. Yeah. Any questions or comments? David?
barely touched on part five. I did not even get to part six of my talk, but uh, yes, there are lots of contradictions, and I just wanted to, to emphasize the challenges. Yes, there are lots of challenges. There are lots of contradictions with what used to be the past and the theories and the knowledge we have. And uh, what is actually happening is really a true revolution, and we are in the center of it. Uh, there is a say in uh, uh, the part of the world that I'm coming from, and it says, if you are within the fire, if the fire is around you, you cannot tell the temperature. You have to be outside to touch the fire. And when you touch the fire, it burns you. And that is where we are. The contradictions are there. The fire is around us. We know it is hot. But we are within it. So uh, I'm just going to turn to you and see if you have a suggestion. Okay, Other questions, comments? Um, I'm glad that you, you use the example of SNAP. I mean, I, I've, um, I think the last 18 months I've probably stayed in Airbnb in every continent. And one thing that I've noticed is, amongst other things, is the significance that Airbnb, as an example, has for women's economic empowerment. Now, I say that very specifically. We in, the, in this area, in the IE space, need to be much clearly engaged with the current research on women's economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Six months ago, the UN Secretary General had a high-level panel report which set out for the first time what that means, led by Laura Tyson, and we now have some real clarity about what that means. What we now need to do, I think, is to pick up on some of the examples which you're highlighting. What does it mean for women's economic empowerment, as one example? And let me take this to Norway. When I walked in by Airbnb in Galway, not only is it a woman who's economically empowered, but a woman in a wheelchair. So, you know, if we're finding models like this that provide mechanisms and opportunities for underrepresented groups in terms of economic activity to be more empowered and more involved, then that's an area of research we should also address. Absolutely. Actually, when uh, Madam uh, Didier Katumeir uh, who has created Nira Ma Mara? Did I? Is uh, the name of uh, the brand name is Rina Mara? Rina Mara in cosmetics, Bio biological cosmetics, nothing, no, no chemicals. Is one of those women who not only perhaps uh, is empowering herself and most of the employees that I venture to say are mostly women, but it's a daring woman, and I ask that question from her. If you are not in food and drug, pharmaceuticals, you have absolutely no clue what FDA approval means. It's a two years process, multi-million dollar cost, lots of lawyers, lots of paperwork, Lots of going back and providing this example and that example. And Niamara, this lady, dared to go to FDA and get their approval. And at the end they say, oh, by the way, we do not recognize Godway-based company. We are, we are not going to give that. She did not say that. that I, I, uh, I assume that that is the case. They said, well, what she said was that they were forced to have a UAE-based company in order to get FDA approval. To me, that means they said, sorry, fella, you have to have a legitimate company in certain countries. So yes, women are being empowered. International entrepreneurship, well, we like to think that it is genderless. It is not. I study actually fast-growing companies. Out of the 2,000 fast-growing companies, only 50 of them are run by women entrepreneurs. If you are interested in doing gender studies, entrepreneurial studies, there is plenty of money everywhere. All you have to, to do is couch your research in terms of gender specificity. Government of China has tremendous amount of money. I'm quite sure EU has plenty of money. 
Other questions, comments? I'm, I'm, I have brought all these things uh, and I don't want to, to take them back. Uh, one is, uh, is uh, uh, a lovely article that Vincian, uh, oh my god, my god, I can't think of uh, her last name. Cervanti. Vincent Cervanti and three co-authors have written. It's a review article of 567 articles, and they categorize, actually, where ID is. And I was actually going to... Uh, no. I was going to, to discuss these five categories. I'm, I'm leaving them here. Please help yourself with one page. This is the five clusters that... Uh, ID was, I think ID has moved. And uh, one last thing that, that uh, I wish I had time to, to build on is the recent editorial that actually touches upon what ID is in terms of characterization. And uh, I'm latching on to Antonella's and building on Antonella's, saying not only is strategy is missing, that gap is missing, but a lot more is also missing. We are not talking about operations, operations management, are we? We have not talked about logistics, how else is that uh, conceived? We have not really talked about what happens over time. There are lots of gaps, and there is a graph, I invite you to, to look at that graph, uh, and, uh, or otherwise there's a copy of yourself, and uh, if you are accustomed to read online, it is the recent issue of Journal of International Information. I really thank you for your time and